The potent images of the cowboy have long shaped the myth of the American West and the definition of American masculinity. This myth has been depicted in literature and on film for more than a hundred years, most famously in the American Western film genre of the 20th century. The conventional view of the Western hero is that he's a solitary man who struggles against the forces of the frontier, exemplifying the values of independence and self-reliance. I'd like to talk about how the masculine ideals defined by the heroic figure of the American cowboy represent both those within the queer community and those who would reject it, ironically in part due to a belief that queer individuals do not fit said conventionally masculine mold. Cowboy life was one constantly surrounded by men, all of whom had their own frailties, ambitions, and needs. Similarly, Hollywood westerns are stories of men, their conflicts, their alliances, their betrayals, their sacrifices, and their devotion. Women are not present in much or any of this, lest they get in the way of the truly significant character and relationship development unfolding on screen. In real life, the cultural boundary imposed between the homosocial and the homoerotic wavered on the range. Likewise, his manly role allows this on-screen American icon to have strong connections with other men while reinforcing his own masculine identity. The harsh landscapes these men traverse and supposedly conquer together in fact mirror their individual turmoils, and the connections formed within this homosocial environment naturally become charged with erotic tension. It's a good-looking gun you're about to use back there. Can I see it? Maybe you'd like to see mine. Nice. Awful nice. On closer examination of the popular cinematic works that have for years promoted a particular image of the mythical cowboy that we all recognize, it is clear that there are certain elements of the cinematic western that lend themselves directly to a queer reading of the genre. This particular realization struck a nerve with actor Sam Elliott, who, on a podcast recently, calmly and logically articulated his thoughts on 2021 western The Power of the Dog. I mean, they made it look like, what are, those, what are all those dancers, those guys who, in New York, that wear bow ties and not much else. Uh huh. Remember them for back in the day? Oh, the Chippendales. Yeah, yeah. That's what all these fucking cowboys in that movie looked like. Uh huh. They're all running around in shaps and no shirts. There's all these allusions to homosexuality yeah. Yeah. throughout the fucking movie. Yeah, I think that's what the movie's about. That is what the movie is about, and it's also what the 1967 semi-autobiographical novel of the same name is about. Thomas Savage, the author, was a closeted gay man who grew up on a ranch in Montana in the 1920s. The story, partly inspired by Savage's real life and the people in it, reflects an experience that would have been understood intimately by quite a few other men who lived a similar lifestyle. Despite the cultural shame that would have undoubtedly been evoked had these men not lived so far from civilized society, the rural areas that they populated and the laborious work they took on provided a pretext for intimate relationships between them. Where Hollywood's mythic western landscape encouraged idealized notions of masculinity and manly virtues which certainly would not have included romancing each other, American cowboys in reality lived with one another, slept in the same bed, groomed each other, danced together, and posed for some lovely photo shoots. In response to Elliot, winner of the 2022 Academy Award for Best Director, Jane Campion, had this to say. I'm sorry, he was being a little bit of a B-I-T-C-H. And I'm sorry to say it, but he's not a cowboy, he's an actor. He is an actor that has played a cowboy, however, notably in Tombstone. You know, this Western. I spent my whole life not knowing what I wanted out of life. Just chasing my tail. Now for the first time I know exactly what I want. And who? Tombstone is just one example of the many American Westerns that present themselves open to an interpretation that directly reflects the lived queer experiences of Thomas Savage, his characters, and countless other men on the range. I sure don't want to lose you. You won't. In the context of being outsiders from society, cowboys already share a similar otherness with queer men. Out on the range, conforming to the compulsory heterosexuality of civilized society is not an issue. Something that the classic American Western often fails to directly address is the question of why their leading hero has chosen this particular way of life, of turning and running from the rest of the world. In Brokeback Mountain, Jack and Ennis are never the same after they return to civilization and attempt to lead normal, domestic lives, inconspicuously blending into their respective heterosexual facades. Brokeback Mountain becomes a sacred refuge, a true so-called mythical space for them to return to a few times each year and wonder whether any of it was real each time they leave. He used to say he wanted his ashes scattered on Brokeback Mountain, but I wasn't sure where that was. Knowing Jack, it might be some pretend place where a bluebird sang and there's a whiskey spring. 
This is the fate that awaits all other Hollywood cowboys when faced with the idea or opportunity to finally return to society, and so they never do. But if Jack and Ennis are pulled back to Brokeback Mountain time and time again by little more than the memories of each other's company, what is it about this rugged lifestyle that entices these other Western heroes, so much so that they can hardly bear to consider abandoning it? Well, he said it was his favorite place. The Western genre flourished primarily during the era of the Hayes Code, which introduced a set of censorship guidelines to be adhered to by nearly every film released by a major studio in the mid-1930s to late 1960s. The code demanded that nothing it deemed immoral be depicted on screen in a positive light, including crime, indecent or sacrilegious acts, overt sexuality, and of course, any kind of perverse relationship. While acts of homosexuality could never have been explicitly shown on screen, heterosexual couples also suffered under the code's restrictions. Confining the range of relationships and romance that could be dealt with directly encouraged writers to become more creative, and filmmakers were tasked with creating inventive ways of depicting sex and other such scandalous acts. Having to censor heterosexual scenes of intimacy meant that, in some cases, there was far greater intimacy able to be depicted in scenes between friends, specifically between male friends. There were certain lines a filmmaker could not cross in depictions of romance, but for friendship, there was no reason for that line to exist. As a result, it was not unusual for the bond between male characters to appear much deeper than that of an explicitly romantic pair. The most passionate relationships in many of the films of this time were between men, especially those starring in westerns. Despite this, most of these films did feature female love interests. Well, a singular one, regardless of the male-to-female ratio. But even where women were involved, their presence and impact was notably lacking. Oh, Miss Malay, what would you say if... if I offered you half of everything I own for a son? Your son? You can have a son, can't you? That's all that matters. By Dunson. Out of Malay. The women that feature in these westerns often represent one very distinct and frightening thing to a lone ranger, domesticity and civilization. This, of course, is what they've been running from and will never commit to. As it is by society, and sometimes the law, their masculine ego is threatened by women. Leaving the community or the woman behind allows the hero to maintain his independence and personal freedom. At least, that's the message the audience is supposed to internalize once the credits roll. Where the men in westerns are complicated individuals with nuanced relationships to each other, their female counterparts are not afforded the same luxury of a well-written character arc. When the love interest is not written to be a three-dimensional human being with a personality separate from the influence of the person they're courting, it is difficult to root for or care about the success of their relationship. Obviously, the most substantial relationships in the film are thus going to be between the interesting characters with depth, a backstory, and a proper arc. Boy, if you ever were my friend, if you ever had even the slightest feeling for me, leave now. Often in westerns, the woman amounts to mere property, while the plot is most concerned with the dealings of other men in relation to the protagonist. There is little more than a marginal space for women in this mythical landscape. When they do manage to squeeze into it, they almost always end up alone. As mentioned, the token female love interest is often relegated to the periphery of the main story or is simply overshadowed by the most important relationship depicted within the narrative, the two men. Occasionally, she gets caught in the middle. The love triangle is a popular characteristic of the Western and can be interpreted through a number of queer lenses. Partly as a result of the underwritten female love interest included for plausible deniability in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the most significant relationship depicted in the film is by and large the one between Butch and Sundance, who remain faithful to each other from the beginning of the film to the very end. Both men, however, have their own bond with Sundance's girlfriend, Etta. Butch? Hmm? Do you ever wonder if I'd met you first, we'd been the ones to get involved? Well, we are involved, really, don't you know that? These three characters each have their own special connection with one another, and they are all perfectly happy to revel in that shared closeness. The Big Sky also features a similarly balanced trio. The receptiveness of these couples and their willingness to share, for lack of a better word, opens the door for additional readings of what the concepts of love and relationships mean to the typically detached characters of the classic Western. Other cowboy triads express their affection a little differently. I've been expecting trouble for days when, when anybody with half a mind would know you two love each other. It took somebody else to shoot you. He wouldn't do it. In her book Between Men, English Literature and Male Homosocial Desire, queer studies scholar Eve Kosofsky sedgwick contemplates Rene Girard's study of the power dynamic within a so-called erotic triangle, wherein the bonds of rivalry and love are differently experienced but equally powerful. 
This theory proposes that the bond between rivals in an erotic triangle is even stronger, more heavily determinant of actions and choices than anything in the bond between either of the loves and the beloved. The beloved is often not chosen for their qualities, but for the fact that they are already the choice of the rival. In High Noon, upset and potentially spurred on by the fact that retiring Marshal Will Kane has denied him from taking over his job, Deputy Harvey Pell takes up with Kane's former lover, Helen Ramirez. You're cutting out with Kane. Oh, Harvey. And why are you going? What difference does it make? It's Kane. It's Kane. I know it's Kane. It isn't Kane. The animosity between the two men reaches a climax when Kane's life is in peril, and Pell urges him to escape town. With both Helen and Kane's new wife absent, Pell takes over what would typically be their role in attempting to persuade Kane to stay safe. Kane refuses, and they roll around on the floor intimately. Sorry, aggressively. Kane then leaves, but not before sealing his victory rather suggestively. While this dynamic presents itself primarily subtextually in the Western, it has occasionally been made more explicit within other genres. ¿Qué manifiesto ni qué charolastras de mierda? Si ni siquiera respetáis vuestros propios mandamientos, como todos los tíos, marcando territorio y dándos de hostias cuando lo único que os gustaría sería follar el uno con el otro. Eso es lo que os gustaría. The inability of these men to properly emotionally express themselves is revealed through their violent tendencies. Violence is an outlet through which the burden of their repressed desires can be released and subsequently revealed. The tensions of life on the range and the intense bonds between the men who live there culminates in emotionally and sexually charged fight sequences with plenty of phallic weaponry and macho displays of dominance. When they're not fighting, they're competing, always trying to one-up each other and ever aware of the other's gaze. Competition is a way for them to show off, to present their strength and their masculinity to one another, a performance to both intimidate and titillate. Go ahead, try it. That's very good. The line between violent display and sexual display is blurred, and the male body in action is the spectacle in the middle of it all. The American cowboy is constantly shown to be handsome and strong, costumed in outfits that accentuate his muscles and the sensuality of his body, where the other figures of American masculinity are dressed in sensible suits and utilitarian uniforms. The Western hero wears fitted, decorated shirts showing off his broad shoulders and the strength of his arms, and are frequently worn open. He wears bandanas to show off his neck and chest. He wears tight jeans and fringed chaps. An essential part of being a cowboy is dressing for the part. Cowboy clothes are showy and expressive, and Westerns have for decades provided their heterosexual male viewers with a socially acceptable opportunity to look at and appreciate the beauty of other men. In such macho films as Westerns, the audience is invited to participate in a particular voyeurism where the male body becomes the object of desire, only for this eroticism to be repressed and denied through scenes of violence. Male homosocial relationships are often presented on screen in this context of violence and aggression. Another popular genre known to explore this particular dynamic within a historically homosocial environment is the war film, where male soldiers are in constant close contact with one another and tensions are always high. Although the homoeroticism brought about by these elements nearly always remains subtextual, there were a number of these productions from around the end of the golden age of the Western whose creators openly acknowledged and confirmed these implications. Well, you got very good at... Uh projecting subtext without saying a word about what you were doing. Uh, the best example I lived through was uh, writing Ben-Hur. And I said, well, I'll never use the word. There'll be nothing overt. But it'll be perfectly clear that Masala is in love with Ben-Hur. Said I'd come back. As with Ben-Hur, for those who were willing to read between the lines, Lawrence of Arabia, directed by David Lean, featured similarly coded language, behaviors, and imagery. He is your friend. Go ahead, do it. You love him. No, I fear him. Then why do you weep? I fear him who love him. How must he fear himself who hates himself? In response to the suggestion that the film was pervasively homoerotic, Lean said, Yes, of course it is, throughout. It does pervade it, the whole story, and certainly Lawrence was very, if not entirely, homosexual. We thought we were being very daring at the time. Early 20th century Arabia or early 1st century Jerusalem, these filmmakers both recognized and took advantage of the homosocial environments their stories were being told within. In a 1978 interview, director Howard Hawks, discussing his intent in creating his films, including Red River and the Big Sky, indicates that he did much of the same. I call it the love story of, uh, between two men. 
I've used it quite a few times in making pictures. I steal from myself because I've, I know quite a little bit about telling that story. There's a great loyalty between the, uh, between the friendship uh, in, of the characters. And uh, they would probably fight if someone said anything about the other man. It's just a peculiarity of the, char of the characters that I try to do. I'll whiskey leave me. Oh, whiskey leave me. I'll whiskey leave me. Remember, I must go home. Since the invent of cinema, the silver screen cowboy has been the epitome of archetypal American values of masculinity and individualism. Homophobic opinion asserts that love between men opposes or even negates Western notions of masculinity, the mythic American cowboy a notable proponent of such constructs. In truth, however, these paragons of manliness prove to audiences that not only is their brand of conventional masculinity quite compatible with certain elements and histories of queerness, it feeds directly into queer readings of overtly gendered cinema like the Hollywood Western. At the time of its release, Brokeback Mountain made many a straight man uncomfortable for a variety of narrow-minded reasons, but also because of the way it explicitly revealed the true homoerotic nature of the Western and the appeal of such within masculine entertainment. Brokeback Mountain is a story about love and conflict between men, just like Red River, and The Big Sky, and Butch Cassidy, and Tombstone, and every spaghetti Western ever. Westerns have always been about more than just the noble but detached manliest man on the range. They're about the two manliest men on the range. Or whatever these John Wayne movies are about. After decades of restrictions, repression, intimate violence, coded language and visuals, triangulations of desire, playing dress up, and blurring the line between the homosocial and the homoerotic, Westerns of the 21st century are beginning to turn all that subtext into text. While Thomas Savage may have been more familiar with ranch life and less fashionable than the protagonist of his story in The Power of the Dog, the similarities that they shared in their experiences as secretly gay ranchers were not unique or as uncommon, both in real life and on the big screen, as Sam Elliott perhaps believes them to be. After all, The West is a mythic space and there's a lot of, a lot of room on the range. 